everybody. Welcome back to my spare bedroom lecture theatre. My day job, as it were, at the moment is being head of the Mathematical, Physical and Life Sciences Division. So uh, this is where I also try to run the whole of Oxford Science from, insofar as heads of division can run anything. But it's my real pleasure to talk about mathematics. And today we're going to get on with the Laplace transform. We're moving on to the second topic in our lecture course and we'll be seeing how it's related to the distributions that we did earlier on but it definitely represents a shift in a very practical direction which lets us solve a whole lot of problems. So this first page here is a, uh, a little preamble and what it says is it's a little uh, segue from distributions which we defined in terms of their action on test functions. We think of it as a weighted average on a test function where in the case of something like the delta function the weight is entirely concentrated at the origin. And now what we do is we narrow down the class of functions we use for the weight to exponentials and this lets us do much more specific things with our averages and the average is now called the famous Laplace transform. I should say that the real origin of this is not so much in weighted averages as in eigenfunction representations of solutions of differential equations. That's quite a mouthful but if you go back to your Fourier series that you did last year those Fourier series were all arising from things like separating the variables in the wave equation and solving the equation d2y by dx squared equals lambda squared y and then you find that lambda has to be plus or minus i n for example for waves on a string and those are in effect eigenvalues of the operator d2 by dx squared. So, and then the corresponding trigonometric functions, sine or cosine of nx, those are the corresponding eigenfunctions. So what we're doing in this part of the course is we're generalizing this to an infinite, infinite interval, in this case a semi-infinite interval in fact, and then later on an infinite interval for the Fourier transform. If you want to know more about this, go and look at the last chapter of the lecture notes, the one called Outlook which gives you just a little bit of an idea of that and it also suggests there might be a whole lot more transforms, not just Laplace and Fourier, but other ones associated with other differential equations and indeed there's the Mellin transform, the Hankel transform, Kantorovich, Lebedev, a whole lot of them, each one arising from a different differential equation. Anyway, that's just all a digression. Let's get on with something specific. First of all, let's just define the Laplace transform. So we start here with a function f of x, which is defined on the interval from zero to infinity. So no longer the whole real line, only positive values of x, non-negative values of x to be specific because we allow the point zero to be in our interval. And then to work out the Laplace transform, which will work as we'll call curly L, curly L F, or more likely F bar of P. We multiply F by e to the minus Px, and <coughs> we integrate from zero to infinity with respect to x. So this is, as I say, a weighted average. And what we're doing is we're counting the values near the origin with a higher weight than the values far from the origin because of the exponential decay in e to the minus Px as as long as p is positive. And we define this not just for real p, but for all p in the complex plane for which this integral exists. And we're definitely going to bring complex analysis into play here. Notice, as I said, that the f really is only defined on naught to infinity. And notice also, if you look at this definition, if you think of f as being a probability density, f sub x of x of a random variable, capital X, then this is working out the expectation of 
e to the minus px. In other words, you take the function e to the minus px of the random variable, you multiply by the density, and you integrate. That's taking the expectation. And this is what's known, of course, as the moment generating function of the random variable x. Just when you do moment generating functions, you would have a plus sign here. So the uh, the plus transform of minus p is the moment generating function of the random variable x. So this is something that you've seen before. Let's look at a couple of examples. So a very simple one, easy one, obviously, is going to be if f is e to the ax, and a can be any complex number here. Then we work out f bar of p, where we've just got to integrate e to the ax, e to the minus px from 0 to infinity, and the steps are obvious. And we end up with 1 over p minus a. But in this line here, we have to have decay at infinity to allow the limit to exist. And that means we have the real part of e p had to be bigger than the real part of a, so that the real part of p minus a is positive to allow for decay as x goes to infinity. So what we see is that the transform exists in a right-hand half plane in the p plane. This is the complex p plane with the real part of p, the imaginary part of p, and the integral exists everywhere to the right of a point p equals a, and that's a general complex a. And this is in general true for Laplace transforms, as we shall see, where they exist, they exist in a right-hand half plane to the right of all their singularities. We'll come back to this repeatedly. Notice, of course, that the function 1 over p minus a, as a complex, a holomorphic function of p, exists in the whole complex plane except for the point p equals a. And this is the process of, if you like, holomorphic continuation or analytic continuation, some people would say. You start with a function defined by, in this case, an integral. The integral only exists for the real part of p greater than the real part of a. But this function exists everywhere. And because 1 over p minus a and this integral agree, they're equal, on a dense set, take any dense set in this right-hand half plane, they agree wherever either of them is holomorphic. That's the identity theorem at work. And this function has a pole at p equals a, which we'll see coming into action later on. Another simple function we could try is powers of x. And these are also pretty straightforward to calculate their Laplace transform. We start with 1, x to the 0. And that's easy. You integrate uh, 1 times d to the minus px, and you get 1 over p. And now, to do x to the n, you can feel an iteration coming on. You start with x to the n. You integrate by parts once, so you integrate on the e to the minus px bit, giving you e to the minus px divided by minus p times x to the n from 0 to infinity, and then two minus signs, that one and the minus from integration by parts cancel, and you have 1 over p times the integral of nx to the n minus 1, that derivative of x to the n, e to the minus px dx, and this is n over p times the Laplace transform of x to the n minus 1. And now you iterate this, and you end up with n factorial over p to the n plus 1, because when you do this one, you're bringing in an n minus 1 over p, and so on, and so on, and so on, n factorial over p to the n plus 1. And then lastly, you use that when n is 0, you have 1 over p. So notice this for memory purposes. The power of p is 1 greater than the factorial on the top. In the exercises, you'll be asked to show that this result holds for not just for integral values of n, but for any n. And then instead of n factorial, you have the gamma function, gamma of n plus 1. And indeed, this whole calculation really is the gamma function in a very mild disguise. We can do trigonometric functions. We could have already done them really, because uh, we know how to do exponentials, but let's do them separately. 
We do it, in fact, you could do it by integrating by parts. It's a bit of a pain, uh, but you can do it. But it's easier to recognize that if A is real, then E to the I AX is cos of AX plus I sine of AX. And so you take the Laplace transform of that, 1 over B minus I A, we know that. Write that as uh, rationalize it. So you multiply by top and bottom by the conjugate. And you see you have the Laplace transform of cos of AX is going to be P over P plus P squared plus A squared. And the Laplace transform of sine of AX, the imaginary part, is going to be A over P squared plus A squared. Now we can use the same trick in the, of the identity theorem. Now using A as the uh, holomorphic variable, not P. We can extend these to all complex values of A, and so this is true for all complex A, not just real A. And it's valid whenever the real part of P is bigger than the modulus of the imaginary part of A, and you just need to fiddle around with the exponential to see why, why this is necessary. Just again for memory purposes, Cos of AX is even in X, but its transform is odd in P. Sine of AX is odd in X, but its transform is even in P. Then just to help you remember which is which. Now let's link back to what we were doing in lectures 1 to 3. We can do the heavy side function and the delta function. So if we take any real A, positive, positive because... Uh, we're only dealing with the positive x-axis. The transform of delta of x minus a is then just e to the minus pa, and that's just by sifting. I've written down here the integral of delta of x minus a e to the minus px, but I really mean the action of delta of x minus a on the continuous function e to the minus px, and that just picks out the value of e to the minus px when x is a, which is e to the minus pa. And for the heavy side function, you just integrate directly the integral from 0 to infinity of the heavy side, e to the minus px. Well, the heavy side kicks in when x is greater than a. So that's the same as the integral from a to infinity. And now we can get rid of the heavy side. That doesn't really need to be there. That's just a 1, e to the minus px. And then that is e to the minus pa divided by p. Now you'll notice that the relation between these, that e to the minus pa and e to the minus pa over p, you multiply this one by p and you get that. Well, we shall see this coming up in a minute. It's to do with the way the Laplace transform handles a derivative. So now we're going to have a nice, uh, a nice result which shows where the Laplace transform exists. We've seen that in all our examples, we require decay as the real part of P goes to infinity for the integral to exist. And you can see that if you just go back to look at uh, any of our Laplace transform integrals, like say uh, this one, x to the n e to the minus px, you need decay in the e to the minus px for this integral to exist. Even though x to the n, of course, grows rapidly at infinity, this decays even faster for any positive real part of p. So that's summed up in, the, uh, <coughs> in this proposition here. If f bar of p exists <coughs> excuse me, for any real part of p equal to p naught, so you know where it does exist, then it exists everywhere to the right of that in the p-plane, and it goes to zero as the real part of p tends to infinity. Neither of these is particularly surprising, because after all, we are taking a um, an integral in which we have an exponential weight, and as you let p get very large, the exponential weight goes to zero. But nonetheless, these are facts which should be proved. 
So for the first one, the first one is easy. Um, if P is greater than P naught, which really means the real part of P is greater than P naught, not just P, the real part of P is greater than P naught, then the modulus of f of x e to the minus px is certainly less than the modulus of f of x e to the minus p naught x because this exponential factor here is smaller in modulus. Remember, it might have a complex part because of the imaginary part of p. You take the modulus and it's just e to the minus the real part of p times x, and that is smaller than this one. And so by straight comparison, the integral exists. For the second one, this is a very long looking calculation, but it's summed up in this picture here. We'll go back to the calculation in a moment and we'll go back to this description. The picture tells it all really. In this picture, you see the x axis, you see your f of x, whatever it is, it could grow at infinity, it could decay, it could grow as fast as e to the ax if you wanted. And then what I do is I multiply f by e to the minus px. And for simplicity here, I'm thinking of p as being real. Then what happens is e to the minus px is a decaying exponential. And so when I multiply that by a decaying exponential, I get something which itself decays to zero, provided that p is sufficiently large, and provided that f isn't so bad, like e to the x squared or something, that uh, multiplying by any exponential doesn't help. So for all reasonable f, and in particular for all f's which are bounded by an exponential, take p large enough, multiply by e to the minus px, and you'll get something which decays as x goes to infinity. So what we're doing is we're integrating this function in x, and what we see is that although this decays at infinity, so the integral exists, that's what we showed just now, it doesn't decay at x equals 0, because e to the minus px, when you put x equal to 0, is always equal to 1. So the convergence to 0 of f of x e to the minus px isn't uniform in x, because it never converges to 0 at x equals 0. So what that means is, when you work out the integral, there's a little region around x equal to 0, and its width is of order 1 over p, where e to the minus px, px in the, in the exponent here, needs to be of order 1, in other words, not very large, for e to the minus px not to be tiny. So when px is of order 1, x is of order 1 over p. And so you have a little region of size 1 over p, roughly, you know, 1 over p, 2 over p, whatever. Doesn't matter what, what size it is in which f is going down from f of 0, or f of x e to the minus px is going down from f of 0 to something exponentially small. So the idea of this proof is what we're going to do is we're going to pick a value out here, somewhere to the right of this region near the origin, and we'll call that a, and we're going to split the integral into two bits. We'll integrate from a to infinity, and we'll integrate from 0 to a. And then we'll let the real part of p tend to infinity, and the bit at the origin will shrink and will give us an integral which is, well, it's like basically the area of a sort of triangular region like this. It's going to be of order 1 over p, but the integral from the rest of it will be exponentially small. So let's go and have a look and see how that works. What we're going to do, remember that p0 is where we know the integral exists. And we're going to write p equal to p0 plus t. And we're going to show that as the real part of t goes to infinity, the modulus of f of p, which is f of p0 plus t, the modulus of transform, sorry, f bar, the modulus of f bar goes to 0. So that means the real part of t is positive. And as I said, we'll take any a greater than 0. And the first key step in the proof, there's a key step marker, is that we split the integral from 0 to a and a to infinity. Once you've done that, there's not really anything to do other than 
use the triangle inequality. That's essentially a forced step in this proof. So the modulus of this integral is less than or equal to the modulus of the first integral plus the modulus of the second integral. And then we come to the second key step, which is we start working on each of these integrals, each of these terms separately. So we start on the first one. The modulus of the integral is less than or equal to the integral of the modulus. So that again is a triangle inequality type statement. And we say we take these modulated inside and then we do the same thing here. We take the modulus inside and at the same time, I've done a little shortcut here. I've instead of writing e to the minus p0 plus t, I've written e to the minus p0x e to the minus tx. And then I know that x is always greater than a in this uh, integral because it's an integral from a to infinity. And so I can pull this out and write it as e to the minus a times the real part of t as an upper bound for the modulus of that particular term. And then I'm left with the modulus of f of x e to the minus p0x dx integrated from a to infinity. Now, the last key step, or the second, the third key step, is we bound this integral. Well, this is an integral over a finite interval. A is fixed. So we know that f is bounded on that interval. We'll call that bound m, depends on a. So we can pull that out. f is, this integral is less than or equal to m of a times the integral of the modulus of what's left, e to the minus p0 plus t times x. And here, this term here, this is a part of the Laplace transform of the modulus of the Laplace transform of f, or the integral of the modulus of f e to the minus px, evaluated at p equals p0. It's a part of it because we're only going from a to infinity. And if the Laplace transform exists, then this must exist as well because it's a part of it. So we have e to the minus a real part of t times some integral which we don't care about except we know that it exists, it's finite. Now we just go and uh, tidy this up. The modulus of the integral here, the modulus of e to the minus p0 plus t is e to the minus the real part of p0 plus t, complex exponential. This is uh, unchanged. Then we do the integral exactly. This is just a straightforward, easy integral. We're writing, uh, oh, I'm sorry, there's an x missing there. There's an x missing in the exponent there. It should say the real part of p0 plus t times x dx. We do the integral explicitly, and you get 1 minus e to the minus a times the real part of p0 plus t. The a is the upper limit divided by the real part of p0 plus t, which is just this constant here coming down when you do the integral of the exponential plus this term, which is unchanged. And now you let the real part of t go to infinity. This term decays algebraically, and this term decays exponentially, but both decay to zero. So that proves that the Laplace transform tends to zero at the real part of p tends to infinity. And as I say here, this is just a little more explanation of why it works. And in particular, if you do a little more work by letting a tend to zero after you've done the calculation, you find that the you get an estimate for how the Laplace transform decays. It looks like f of zero divided by p. This is called Watson's lemma. This would be a good moment for your 2020-20 exercise. I'll pause for a second to let you do that. OK, let's move on then. We're going to do some more properties of this Laplace transform. And um, these are quite straightforward ones. First of all, the Laplace transform of 
f of x e to the minus ax is f bar of p plus a. And the Laplace transform, this isn't so obvious. Oh, f of x minus a, the translation of f times the heavy side of x minus a is e to the minus a p f bar of p. You can see there's sort of symmetry here that f e to the minus ax and f bar e to the minus a p. We'll see this much more clearly when we come to the Fourier transform. This thing here, you just have to deconstruct this, unpack it a little bit. This is just the translation of f by a. So here's your f. You just move it along by a, the same f moved to start at a, and then you fill in these values by zero, which is why you have the heavy side of x minus a there. So the proofs are very easy. They are just a straightforward calculation. For the first one, f of x e to the minus ax, you take the transform of it. Well, there it is, f of x e to the minus ax, e to the minus px dx, do the integral. You take the ax and the px together to give you p plus a times x, which is f bar of p plus a. And for the other one, very similarly, f of x minus a, heavy side of x minus a, e to the minus px. Well, that's the same as the integral. You make the change of variable uh, x minus a equals t. You first of all realize the heavy side means you integrate from a to infinity, f of x minus a, e to the minus px. Then you make the change of variable f of t, x minus a equals t, e to the minus t, x equals a plus t. And this is the e to the minus a p. That comes out as a factor times f bar of p. And these help us in identifying functions given their transforms. Uh, we are assuming, of course, that the function is uniquely determined by the transform. And this is a result we're going to come on to later on in the course. You'll know, you may know the same result in probability where the moment generating function uniquely determines the distribution. So we're going to end with some examples. Examples 47 and 48a from the, uh, so these are variations of examples from the lecture notes. Find the inverses of, well, there's quite a lot on this slide. Let's work through it. First of all, 1 over p times p minus 1. So you put this into partial fractions. Uh, my way of doing that to work out the coefficient of uh, one over p, you cover up the p in the on the bottom, and then you put p equal to zero, which is where this vanishes, and you get minus one on the bottom, so the coefficient is minus one. To get this one, you cover up p minus one and put p equal to one. And that gives you 1, so you have minus 1 over p plus 1 over p minus 1. Of course, all you're doing here is working out residues of a function with simple poles, a rational function with simple poles. And so f of x is minus 1, because the transform of 1 is 1 over p, and then e to the x, because the transform of e to the x is 1 over p minus 1. And you look at this and you know immediately where the integral is going to converge. It's going to converge for the real part of p greater than 1. And that is indeed true. When you multiply e to the x by e to the minus px, you need the real part of p greater than 1. But you know that's true because this function has a singularity at p equals 0 and a singularity at p equals 1. P equals 1 is the right-hand one, the, the furthest to the right, and so the Laplace transform exists everywhere to the right of that. What about e to the minus p over p squared? Well, you know, 1 over p squared is the Laplace transform of x. If you go back to the transforms of powers slide, you'll see the transform of 1 is 1 over p, x is one over p squared, x squared is two over p cubed, and so on. So one over p squared is x. So e to the minus p over p squared is the Laplace transform of, if you go back to the previous page, two pages, this one here, f of x minus a, h of x minus a, 
e to the minus a p f bar of p. Now a is one in this example, so this is the Laplace transform of x minus one times the heavy tide of x minus one, a function which goes along until x equals one, and then goes up and has a uh, a gradient of one after that. F bar of p is p over p squared minus 2p plus 5. Well, that looks a bit more ambitious. Of course, you could do this by partial fractions. You could solve the, find the roots of this, and then uh, you could put it into partial fractions and write the result as two exponentials. But actually, in this case, it's easier because the roots are complex and the possibility of making a mistake is high. It's much easier to say, well, 1 over p minus 1 squared plus 4. You write the top as p minus 1 plus... Sorry, that should be a p, shouldn't it? p over p minus 1 squared plus 4 is p minus 1 plus 1 over p minus 1 squared plus 4 on the bottom. Okay, so that's a p. I'll go and correct that for you. And now you go back and look in your lookup table of Laplace transforms. Cot of ax went to p over p squared plus a squared. Sine of ax went to a over p squared plus a squared. Remember, cot is even, the transform is odd, and so on. So we just have to identify these here. You're going to put a equal to 2, because the 2 squared is 4 here. And then you've got to deal with the fact that this is p minus 1, not p. And when you see a p minus 1, when you have a f bar of p minus 1, you know that you are multiplying by e to the x in the same way that here, when you had 1 over p minus 1, you got e to the x. This is 1 over p, with p replaced with p minus 1. So instead of 1, you get e to the x times 1. Here, you get e to the x times cot of 2x from this one and e to the x times sine of 2x from this one with divided by 2 to, to get take care of that a on the top. You might ask why we didn't take a equal to minus 2. So it's a little exercise to work through what would happen if you did. So what we've done so far is we've defined the Laplace transform. We've shown some very basic properties of it. And we've shown that we can use those properties to start to construct something that would be, a, as it were, a lookup table of the Laplace transforms and the functions they came from. In other words, the inverses of those transforms. Transforms. What we haven't yet seen is how to use the Laplace transform to do anything useful. And that's what we're going to be doing in the next two lectures. So I'll see you then.